Author Media presents Novel Marketing, the longest-running book marketing podcast in the world. This is the show for writers who want to build their platform, sell more books, and change the world with writing worth talking about. I'm your host, the professor of book marketing, Thomas Umstadt Jr., and today we're going to talk about crowdfunding. If you ever had an idea for a book but weren't sure if there was a market for it, or perhaps you just don't have the funds to make your dream happen, but you know there's an audience who would happily help pay for it in exchange for a copy of your book. Well, crowdfunding takes advantage of those problems and turns them into solutions. And the other thing I really like about it is that it's based off of solid marketing psychology fundamentals like urgency, scarcity, popularity, and others we haven't yet talked about on the podcast. So if you've ever been curious about Kickstarter or Indiegogo as an author, stick around because we're going to get into the details. And we have a special guest to get into those details with us. You're probably familiar with him. He's been on the show a time or two before, and he's written several very popular books including Right to Market and five How to Write 5,000 Words Per Hour. Chris Fox, welcome back to the Novel Marketing Podcast. Hey, Thomas. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So what is crowdfunding? For the people who heard the term and they're like, what on earth is that? Crowdfunding is what we wanted as little kids when we thought about writing for books. The ability to go to everyone, the internet, the world, and say, hey, listen, I want to make this cool thing. But I don't have the resources to do that. If you guys will each pledge a little bit of your own resources, we can make this really cool thing together. Uh, And and if you are offering is good enough, then you get enough, you know, geeks to come together and whatever your hobby is and they fund it. That's right. In some ways, it's not too different from like church where they pass the plate to fund the church, right? Some people put a little bit, some people put a lot, and some people don't put anything. But everyone gets to benefit from the kind of crowd backing of the activity. So I, sh- you know, now you have a Kickstarter currently in progress. It's not for your book, but it's for a role playing game based off of your book. Which, by the way, for those of you writing science fiction and fantasy, consider uh, role playing as a part of your strategy, either to help you write it or maybe as a way of monetizing it. But wh- I want to ask, why did you put it on Kickstarter? I decided to go to, to Kickstarter because I, I figured that would be the best way for me to raise awareness. Um, I've, I've funded the game primarily with my own resources just from my fiction sales, uh, so I didn't necessarily need the income from the Kickstarter, but I decided, okay, if I take the money from the Kickstarter and I make that the, the art budget for the game going forward for the next 12 months, that's sort of a, a great way to kick it off. And since I knew there'd be a lot of people that were excited about the novels, I was gambling that they would also be excited about the role-playing game and maybe jump on board the Kickstarter. Yeah. Now, the first step of crowdfunding is building a crowd. So walk us through what you did to build the crowd ahead of this campaign. I did very few of the traditional things that I think you would do with a Kickstarter. So normally what you would do is you'd spend, I don't know, three to four months raising awareness. You would go on podcasts. You would um, make posts. You would create uh, free content you could give away through content marketing. Like let's say you're you're going to do a crowdfunding for an audio book. Maybe you create an audio sample and you put that in a Facebook ad and you let that float around the internet and you see if you can get people to listen to the sample and then get interested in the Kickstarter when it does finally go live. Most crowdfunding sites will allow you to set up a page long before it actually goes live so that people can see that you're going to start a Kickstarter on a certain date. So I would recommend building that awareness as soon as possible. Uh, I just had my first child, so I did very little of that myself. I'm fortunate enough that because I've been a fiction author for as long as I have, that was the audience I was turning to and asking for help. Um, So my crowd has been sort of built for my fiction. Well, and you've been hyping this game for a while. I mean, I listened to your Magitech audiobooks, I don't know, last year or the year before, and you were talking about the role-playing game that you were working on developing, and I think the letter to the reader at the end, or you, you, were, you were mentioning it, and so as I was reading the books, I was like, oh, I can see how these characters could fit into a role-playing game. So you were definitely building anticipation kind of organically. Were you doing that consciously, or did that just kind of happen by accident? I think mostly that was just my enthusiasm. So it was a happy accident. I wanted people to know because I was so excited about it. And um, I've been running sessions of the game for several years now. So I always knew it would be finished. But, you know, I didn't realize it would take as long as it did to uh, to get that much artwork. That's right. Because you're giving away the game for free, right? Like people can just go to your website and get the rules for the game. So why would somebody back this project if they can get the game itself without spending any money? The beautiful thing about gamers, and I love this about them, is we all want a a physical copy of the book. 
um, you want to have a hardcover book, or even if you're 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 a huge technophile and you love your iPad and and you read all of your role playing books on the iPad, you still want to have something you can hold in your hands. And so, lots and lots of people want to purchase a physical version. Some people wanted an autographed copy. Um, others wanted to have their name in a novel or have a short story written about a character that they'd conceived of. So, there's lots of things you can offer if fans are in love with a the universe. They they want to deepen their connection with that universe. So if you think about like Star Wars. Wars as an example. If a Kickstarter were being run for Star Wars and you could get your own lightsaber made, lots of people would pay a whole bunch of money to do that. Yeah. So what I love about that, you know, we talked about this on an earlier episode about taking advantage of both scarcity and ubiquity. So, you know, and savvy authors do this with their books. You've got the ebook that can sell an unlimited number of copies. Anyone can buy it cheap, but you also have artifacts, rare, expensive versions of the book, whether it's a signed paperback or a hardback or even a signed and numbered limited edition book that you sell for a lot of money. And that's what you're working into your crowdfunding campaigns. You've got, you know, cheap levels, but you also have really expensive levels that are you know limited and rare and scarce walk us through those kind of pricier reward levels that you have yeah absolutely um and, and to be clear i didn't expect any of these to uh be pledged at i didn't think anybody would actually give me this amount of money for the things i was offering but i figured hey i'm gonna try anyway um so initially you have various versions of the games at different prices ranging from twenty dollars will get you the pdf uh, up to a hundred dollars is going to get you a hardcover copy of the rpg and then beyond that, you start getting into some very expensive rewards. So the first one that lots of people are taking is $180 for a signed hardcover. And what that means is I'm going to take time to write a very personalized message to each of those 10 people and send them that book. And I think that's why they were interested. You were talking about an artifact. This is as much of an artifact as you can get. The first page of this book has their name on it. It's just the people that backed it. It's going to be 10 people on one page. Uh, and obviously they were really excited. So those are almost already gone. And we're only, what, 10 days into the Kickstarter? And this makes it scarce, right? Because there's only 10 copies of this $180 book, in, which makes it valuable. It, and it, it creates urgency, right? Especially right now, right? There's only one left. Chances are by the time you hear this, because it'll take us a little while to get this episode edited, uh, this level will be sold out, right? Because of that sense of urgency and that sense of excitement. And yet 10 people at $180 each, that's $1,800. That's a good amount of the way towards your goal. Right. That's quite a bit of the artwork I'm looking to make with the, the funds from this. The next couple levels are even more nuts. Uh, for $400, they can add a character to the official novels. And for $600, I'll write a short story about their character. And that'll be one of the chapter intros in the book. And both of those have had a couple of backers so far. And these are short stories you're going to write anyway. Right. So this is work I already had slated. Yeah, it's no additional work for you. And yet they now totally feel a sense of ownership in the project because the work you were going to do about you know, some random character uh, you're now doing about them. And this is very reproducible. So a lot of you are like, oh, this is a video game or a board game. How can I use it for my book? You know, The names of the characters in your book? could be up for auction. <laughs> you know, people would potentially be willing to spend a lot of money to have a character named after them. And I've seen this done in crowdfunding campaigns quite a bit. People love to be immortalized, especially by an author that they love and respect. And I'm, I'm taking it a step further. I didn't put this in the reward, but I'll actually be doing a, a Skype or a Zoom call or whatever platform they want to do to talk about the stuff that we're creating for them. And one of them is a 16-year-old kid in Florida um, and his dad bought this for him, and he's super excited because he loves the Magitech Chronicles. And so for me as a creator, it's tremendous fun. I actually get to work with my super fans, and that is a real privilege in my opinion. That's right. And you are smart to limit these levels because this is also risky, right? If you're planning to do a Skype call and 100 people – back to this, right? If it went crazy viral, now you're locked into a hundred Skype calls <laughs> for an introvert. That's the special hell, right? You wouldn't want that. Uh, and yet this one is limited to just six people or just eight people, depending on the level and eight Skype calls. That's totally manageable, especially if each person's paying $600 for that level. Exactly. So you've got that scarcity where there's only going to be a few of them. And then you also have, it's more of a manageable workload for me. All right, so you'd think, oh, $600, that's the top level, but it's not. There are two even higher levels. And I will say there's a rule of thumb here that different people want to back at different price points. And there's a certain kind of person that's going to want to back at a really high price point. And I experienced this with my 
book. I had a $10,000 goal for my book that I put on Kickstarter. And my biggest backer backed, I think, at the $1,500 level for $2,500. So he, he overpaid $1,000 on purpose because he wanted the campaign to succeed. And that one backer, who I had never met, this was a stranger to me. We had friends in common, but I had never met this person. And that $2,500 was the difference between success and failure on the campaign. And it really made a difference. So uh, tell us about your super big level. Um, One of my super big levels is unlikely to get any backers, uh, but that's sort of due to external circumstances. I'm at ground zero for the coronavirus. Yay! I'm I'm in Northern California. (laughs) (laughs) And so there's starting to be cases that are in the area. And I'm talking about flying people out to come attend a game in this area that I'm running. (laughs) Uh, so no one has backed it so far. I'm not sure anybody will. And I was asking twelve hundred and fifty dollars for that twelve fifty. I'm paying for the the hotel for one night, um, and then we would hang out and actually run the game um, that that I'm creating. That one I don't think I'll get any any takers for. But the most expensive level was the very first pledge, so far as I can tell. And that's five thousand dollars or more. I offered up a license to the RPG. So when the RPG is done and the system is fully created, if somebody has a series of novels or a successful IP and they want to skin that IP over a role playing game, we can help them with that process. And I wasn't sure if anybody would take this, but to my shock, somebody bought it on the first day. And it makes sense because you're not just taking some pre existing RPG engine and skinning it. You're actually rebuilding a brand new engine from scratch, which is very unusual. I know a lot of authors who do RPGs with their games, and they found one system or another that works for them, which is great. There, It allows you to start you know, having your game be an RPG right away. Uh, and yet, this is one of the advantages of doing it from scratch, is that you can license it. Right. It's tremendously difficult unless you're hugely into statistical analysis, uh, sociology, psychology, economics, and a whole bunch of other disciplines. It may be beyond the scope of what most people want to do. But if you're somebody who grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons and you love role playing games and you also happen to be a writer, it's a great idea to make your own game if you've got the time. Right. So this may not be reproducible, you know, for your typical author of creating a system from scratch, but I don't want you to think about, you know, reproducing it in that way. Just think about it kind of think outside the box a little bit of what kind of really high level uh, reward could I put here? And one that a lot of authors do is I will speak at your event. And that was what my top event was. You know, it was, I think it was, you know, it was $1,500 and I'll come and speak at your event on on the topic of the book. And what's interesting is that the backer at that level never ended up having me speak because he just wanted to support what I was doing. He was supporting the cause, not because he was like booking me to speak, but it's a really easy thing as an author, especially if you're writing nonfiction, you want to do more speaking gigs, you can sell those speaking gigs through here. And another thing that you could do is sell your books through here. So I know, Chris, you're not doing this, but there's you could create a bundle of get a signed copy of every one of Chris Fox's books for $500 or something like that for your super fans who are also wanting your paper books. So there's a way of cross-promoting different products if you wanted to. Oh, I'm totally adding that by the end of the day. <laughs> there you go. Get get you some consulting right here, and it and it doesn't <laughs> and it doesn't cost you much to give, right? You've got those books in stock already. Uh, it's also a really great sweetener that you could add uh, to your other levels. Speaking of sweeteners, actually, uh, I've noticed that you've got some stretch goals. So your original goal for the campaign was six thousand dollars, which you, thanks to your five thousand dollar backer, got within two or three hours. I think it, it funded very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now you're up to $15,000. And how Kickstarter works is that it's all or nothing. So there's a huge incentive to get a Kickstarter funded because if you have a $6,000 goal and you only raise $5,000, none of the people who pledged, none of their credit cards are charged and you receive no money, which is really great because it makes failure very inexpensive, right? The worst thing you want is to commit to spending $6,000 on art and printing hardback books and you only have $4,000 to cover those expenses. But then the question is, how do you continue motivating people to back and to spread the word about the campaign after you hit your goal? And the solution that a lot of Kickstarter creators do, and I noticed you've done this as well, is you created stretch goals. So what is a stretch goal? And then walk us through some of your stretch goals. So stretch goals are unofficial on most platforms, so so far as I can tell. And basically what you're saying is, okay, you know, let backers, if 
you hit a certain financial milestone, we'll do extra beyond what we've already promised in the Kickstarter. So my Kickstarter is saying, I'm going to give you this base game and you can play the Magitech Chronicles. And then our first stretch goal is $15,000, which we just hit um, this morning, as a matter of fact. We'll create a line of five miniatures that they can use to play the game with. So miniatures are optional if you play role-playing games. Some people use them, some people don't. But most people do in the groups that I've played in. And oftentimes you'll be forced to use miniatures for other games because you don't necessarily have them for a niche game. Well, we're pleased that we can now offer those because we hit this stretch goal. We got you know more money than we were expecting, and that's part of what we're choosing to use the funds for. And there's a series of goals beyond that as we get higher and higher, tiering all the way up to $40,000. And we're willing to do a whole bunch of different things at these various levels if fans help us hit them. And what's good about a stretch goal is that it keeps people motivated. But the key to stretch goals, because you can really get yourself into trouble, is you have to do the math ahead of time. So uh, where they make sense is when there's really good economies of scale, where because we have 10,000 people ordering this product, our cost on a per unit basis has gone down. And we can use that extra savings to improve the product somehow. So we were going to have plastic tokens, but we have a stretch goal at $100,000 to have uh, metal tokens, that, that sort of thing. And if you've done your homework ahead of time or you're doing your research during the campaign, you can do that where it doesn't bankrupt you. Another way that's a really great kind of stretch goal, especially for authors, is you put your audiobook production in as a stretch goal. And you know, so let's say it costs five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to fund your book, the cover and the editing. You know, you've done your budget, and you've found a audiobook narrator that for you know three thousand dollars will make an audiobook version. Well, you could set a five thousand dollars stretch goal because you want some extra room in there <laughs> for unanticipated expenses, and say once we hit that extra five thousand total dollars of backing, then everyone gets an audiobook. So you kind of upgrade the backing levels that everyone else uh, has backed at. And that works really well with a digital gift, right? Because there's no per unit cost. Whereas like these five figurines, that's that's riskier. Actually, you'll notice that's a digital reward. So if you read carefully, I'm giving them the files so that they can create their own miniatures, but we're not printing the miniatures themselves. Ah, so very smart. So they can, on their own 3D printer... Uh, they can make them their, themselves, but you're not actually manufacturing them and sending them out. Exactly. And it was for that reason. All of our rewards are digital. All of them. The only exception, and this was requested by backers, was that we put some of the material in the main book because they wanted a hard copy of it. So what we agreed is it'll it'll slightly raise printing costs because the book will be bigger. But if they hit our 20, 25, 30, and $35,000 goals, we'll add the content that we're creating for them directly into the book. So they'll not only get the digital, but they'll also get a hard copy of it. I love that. Uh, another idea of a stretch goal you might consider is like a bonus chapter. You know, sometimes you've outlined, for nonfiction, I think this works better. You've outlined your 10 chapters on your topic, but there's another topic you could bring in for a bonus chapter. Could be interesting. Or a special backers only uh, Q&A or webinar. It's some kind of online event that only the backers can come to and only if you hit a certain level. These are nice in the fact that they don't cost you much on a per person basis or anything on a per person basis, but they give value to everyone. And I fully support your make it yourself <laughs> stretch goals because uh, manufacturing those totally changes all of the economics of everything else you're doing. It changes how profitable each reward level is for you. Absolutely. And there are other avenues through which they can get miniatures made. So there's a site called Hero Forge that you know, people can make custom miniatures on. And we just sort of point them in the direction of other companies that exist that can do what they need. So it's lowering the burden on us, but still giving them ultimately what they're after. So what sorts of things did you learn the hard way as a crowdfund creator? I'm, I'm still learning. So the first thing is that you definitely want to spell out shipping ahead of time and make sure you understand how that works. Um, you're going to get a lot of questions about shipping if you don't spell it out. People all over the world are seeing this. Um, I'm in the United States and I have a, a somewhat US-centric view of the world as a result. So you know, you've got to think about the fact that there are people in Asia and Africa and Australia that are going to be considering backing this Kickstarter and you want to make it just as friendly for them to do. So that was probably the biggest takeaway I've had so far. 
That's right. And when you're calculating shipping, one of the things you've got to take into account is this wonderful thing called customs, which is really easy to overlook because as a normal citizen, customs are never something that you typically interact with, right? You fly to another country, you have to fill out the customs form, you never have anything to declare typically because most of the sorts of things as a tourist wouldn't be declared and you don't have to pay those. But certain countries, and I think Australia is one of these, have just an incredibly high duty on books being shipped into Australia. And what a lot of companies will do is they'll print the books in Australia, print on demand. So like if you're through Amazon KDP print, they have printers in Australia. They'll send the digital files into the country for free and then print the books locally so they don't have to pay that duty. And some countries have really high tariffs and really high trade burdens. Some countries have really low trade burdens, and some countries are in the process of raising their trade burdens. Um, <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> but <laughs> but you have to budget that because maybe it's, it's ten dollars to ship to Australia. Now I'm making up numbers here, uh, and but potentially there's five dollars of, of tariffs that you have to pay in addition to that shipping. And so if all you do is calculate the shipping through UPS or whatever, it's really easy to miss those five dollars. And if you have had a hundred people who've backed at, at that level, that suddenly that's five hundred dollars worth of unanticipated costs of t- these taxes that you didn't realize you had to pay to this government you didn't you couldn't name the prime minister of, and who you didn't vote for. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do you have any regrets so far? Anything you could go back and do differently? I don't. I sure don't. Um, I did this way differently, I think, than most people approach a Kickstarter. And again, I have the luxury of already having um, a fairly large following. But I didn't put a ton of effort into this. I didn't do a bunch of uh, a podcasts. I didn't um, put in a bunch of extra time into prepping things. I just sat down and I made the best Kickstarter page that I could. And I made the best role-playing game that I could. And, you know, crossed my fingers and said, okay, if I put this in front of the right audience, then it's going to work. Um, my most successful ads right now are on Reddit. Uh, Facebook is working okay too. But people are, are buying, you know, a $20 backing on a, a Kickstarter for an ad that costs the same as what I'd normally do to advertise my four ninety nine book. Okay, so let's jump into that. So as one of the ways you're promoting this campaign is you're buying Facebook ads and you're buying Reddit ads. Walk us through kind of what your strategy is there. It's very straightforward and it's much um, more approachable, I would argue, than just selling a book. So I also sell books on these platforms. And people approach a transaction very differently than somebody asking for help. So when I say, hey, do you want to buy my book? They may think about it. But if I say, I'm making a role-playing game, will you help me do that? There are a lot more gamers are interested in contributing to something like that. So the first phase of my advertising has been help us fund. Now that we're funded and we hit the first stretch goal, I'm changing it to thank you so much for helping us hit that. Can you help us hit the rest of the stretch goals? And it's my contention, and I guess we'll see if this is true, that more people will get interested because they're not only getting the base, they've already gotten the first stretch goal. And if they push, they're going to get more stuff. So it's going to just increase the value of what they get. Which is the fun thing about stretch goals. It keeps your backers motivated to keep spreading the word. Uh, But one of the things that's helping make these ads more effective is the built-in urgency of Kickstarter, right? There's a very real deadline. You only have, as we record this, only 21 days to back the campaign. At the end of those 21 days, this page locks. Kickstarter locks it. It collects all of the money from everyone who's pledged. And then you can never back the campaign ever again like it is it, and it's one of the real like deadlines in the world and people who are familiar with kickstarter know that they know that they have to make a decision now whereas buying a book i can always put that off right oh i don't know if i want that chris fox book now i'll decide tomorrow right and then tomorrow comes and i decide tomorrow and i push it off and push it off and you know maybe you've got some sale that you're trying to use to create some urgency but even then oh maybe he'll have another discount you know, sometime in the future, whereas Kickstarter acts as that third party. <laughs> it's like, no, for reals, this is going to end. We're going to turn the page off at this certain time. Yeah. And I suspect people respond very strongly to that. in like, let's say the last 48 hours of the Kickstarter. Yeah, it's it's very common. Your typical Kickstarter campaign has uh, what we call in the crowdfunding community, the Golden Gate Arches. And, and Chris, yours will have a slightly different shape because you funded so quickly. But imagine your typical campaign it will have a big launch at the beginning in terms of a lot of backers all at once. And then it will have another big flood of backers right around funding because a lot of people want to be the person who pushed the button that made the difference, right? You're at 9999 and they donate and it pushes you over the edge. So a lot of people will hover hoping to be that and you'll get a big flurry 
right around the funding time. And so that's the middle arch of the Golden Gate Bridges. And then you have a final funding in the last 48 hours. And it's not uncommon for the last 48 hours to equal, uh, you know, 50% or more of everything you brought in up to that point. So people procrastinate and that deadline really works well. And there's a great service called KickTrack, which is like an analytics page for Kickstarter. And it pulls in the data from your page. It's free to use. And it gives you some really neat graphs. It uses some machine learning to project what you're going to hit uh, based off of what you've brought in so far and its other uh, data that it has in its vault. And uh, I, I find it really useful. It's actually the reason why I use Kickstarter over Indiegogo is just because of this third-party site called KickTrack that's got such great charts. Yeah, I just uh, I calculated it all by hand because I love that that same numbers and, and I'm a student of data science. I, I wish I'd known about that tool ahead of time. <laughs> nerd, nerd. <laughs> but for those of you who don't like like the idea of calculating it by hand, use the free site KickTrack. Uh, just other, get the graphs. Yeah, just, just get the graphs. <laughs> and the other thing, nice thing about KickTrack is that you can use it as a backer too. So if you're curious about a campaign, you know, let's say it's 40 percent funded and it's got seven days left, and you're like, is this going to make it? You can just as a backer put it into KickTrack and and see. And I will say, uh, Chris, that you have a course, Ads for Authors, that I fully uh, recommend. In fact, it's the only third-party course that patrons get a discount on. Uh, so there's lots of courses in this world, and it's the only one that has the Thomas Umstadt actual patron discount uh, stamp of approval. And in that course, you talk about Facebook ads, and you also talk about Reddit ads. And I do want to say Reddit ads are not for everyone. They work really well for you because you're targeting the kinds of people who are on Reddit. Board gamers, you know, nerdy dudes are on Reddit quite a bit. If you're writing sweet romance, Reddit's probably not uh, yeah, going to be. Yeah, I would move to Tumblr <laughs> if I was writing romance. Yeah, Reddit's <laughs> not going to be your not going to be your place. So what other advice uh, do you have for somebody who's thinking about putting their campaign on Kickstarter? Um, be as honest and genuine as you can. Tell these people, listen, this is what I'm trying to do. Odds are really high that these are the people that want to help you and they love your stuff already. If you're writing novels, they love your universe and they want to see it succeed and flourish. So give them as many ways that they can be a part of things as possible. And as soon as, as is humanly possible, get a community set up where your people can talk. And not just talk to you, but also talk to each other because that's the, where the real power of community comes from. When you have to be in every conversation for the conversation to happen, you don't yet have a real community. You have the beginnings of one because at least there's talking, but it's it's once your fans start talking to each other that it becomes this kind of self-perpetuating uh, flywheel that really can power uh, your career quite successfully. Uh, there's a couple of things, Christy, I thought you did really well. Um, that are worth pointing out for those of you who are curious. And one is you have some really good graphics. So a lot of people are wanting to put their book on Kickstarter in order to fund their cover because they can't afford a cover designer. And I think that's a mistake. I think you need at least one really strong set of visuals, but ideally more. This is one of the reasons why children's books often do so well on Kickstarter because it's they lend themselves really well. You can share the two or three illustrations from your illustrator that you're able to afford. And you're like, we want more like this. And you're able to visually tell the story of your campaign. And I can tell that you've already invested quite a bit of money into some really strong art for your book. I think that I would agree completely that that is necessary if you want to stand out. There are, as of this writing, probably a thousand role-playing games available on Kickstarter, and I'm just making that number up, but I mean, it's enough that it's it's daunting. If you're going to stand out even slightly, you have to have top-notch artwork, and you have to have a great value proposition. So this is one of those things where I wouldn't use Kickstarter to get the first chunk of money for a project. I would find another way to get enough, like Thomas suggested, to at least have a cover made and get my, you know, my whole proposition together, and then I might think about Kickstarter. And I will say, Kickstarter's rules require you to kind of sort of do that. So you're required to have a quote-unquote prototype of your whatever your product is. So you can't just say, I have an idea to build a space elevator, right? And I'm going to fund it. You, you have to have some kind of specific prototype. And the definition of what constitutes a prototype is kind of purposefully vague. Uh, so for an author, technically all you need is like an outline of your chapters. But I don't think that that's enough because the more that you share, the closer you are to being finished, the more of an idea of what the finished product is going to look like and the more excited uh, your backers will be. The, the one exception I might offer is if you have a long running series with a fan base and you're trying to kickstart the next book. So if you're putting out book seven, 
Uh, maybe you could get away with no cover if you could just tell these people I'm putting out the next book in the series. So I, I, possibly there's exceptions, but every Kickstarter you do is going to do better if it's got great artwork. That's right. And I actually really like the idea of kickstarting, you know, book six of a series, because what can you put in your earlier rewards? The first five books in your series, right? Signed copies or, <laughs> or maybe a special signed hardback, right? That only is for Kickstarter backers. You know, it's not hard, it's even print on demand, you can do it with a paperback to create a Kickstarter exclusive edition that's got something special, something unique. And you're like, we're only going to pr print 200 copies of this or 250 copies of this. And suddenly, people who have already paid for the ebook version of your book may be willing to spend $10, 20 $25 for the paper version of your book because they want that unique, special element. Uh, other things that are really inexpensive for you to put into your rewards that are really valuable for your backers is listing your backers in the book, right? You can list a lot of backers really inexpensively, right? The two or three pages will cover hundreds of names. And uh, for me, I think it, you had to back at the $25 level to get your name in the book. And for $25, you got the print version and the electronic version, and you got your name in the book. And that was a really popular level. And it cost me the cost of the print version to deliver. So I had, you know, three or four dollars worth of um, KDP costs for what was ultimately a $25 level, which allowed me to have that extra money on hand to pay for all of the editing that I needed because I needed a lot of editing. <laughs> I hired a lot of <laughs> editors. I spent basically my entire $10,000 on editors. It, it's a little bit of an overstatement, but not too much. And every time somebody gives me a compliment on the quality of the writing. I'm like, yeah, well, it was the team of editors who were turning mud into a masterpiece. But I, I do think that that's another thing to think about of what other kind of fun rewards can I give that are valuable to my backers? Also motivating them on a regular basis. So I send out an update every two to three days. I haven't let longer than three days go by without an update. I'm including pictures and sort of the work I'm doing on the game so they can see the project is moving forward. Uh, and that seems to be working well to convert people who have been on the fence. So you can see in Kickstarter, I've got X number of followers and I've presented, you know, I've converted, let's say 15 or 20 or 30% of them, whatever that percentage is. And then every time I do an update, I go back and I look and you can see that conversion ticking over where you're getting people to, to invest that hadn't done so. Have you sent out an email to your big list yet about this campaign? I did. I did. So that's one piece we haven't talked about. Uh, you want to dig your well before you're thirsty, right? You want to have built your email list ahead of time. So you're talking about, oh, I didn't do anything to prepare. You know, I was busy having a baby. And I'm like, yeah, but you've been building an email list for years. <laughs> and that, yeah. So I effectively, I prepped for six years. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got an unfair head start over most people because I have that successful um, fiction following. That's right. And the deeper you dig that well, the more people you have on your email list, the easier these sorts of things are. Uh, and there's one el more element of your campaign I want to kind of talk a bit about, and that is your video. Now, you filmed this video the same way you film all of your YouTube videos. It's just, you know, I guess it's your webcam, you shoot it in your office. And what you did really well, though, is that you compared your product to your closest competitors, if competitors is the right term, but you compared it to a lot of other role-playing games to give people watching the video a good sense of how you're different, how you're special, and how you're uh, similar to the things they already like. I think a lot of people are terrified to do that, to terrified to say, I'm similar to this author, this author, and this author in these ways. And yet it makes it so much more approachable for a backer to be like, oh, I'm familiar with that. And yeah, that was annoying about that game system. I'm glad it's different about yours. Or, oh, yeah, I read in your book about the catalyst. That would be a really fun rating opportunity. And uh, so I thought you did a really good job with that in the video. Thank you. Did you do a lot of takes or did you like walk us through the process of putting that together? Um, actually, that was the, the first take. Uh, I, I just sat down and recorded it. The advantage that I have is that, A, I'm passionate about the project and B, I record these videos all the time. In this instance, I just talked about, okay, if I was sitting down face to face with myself and I had to convince myself to buy this role playing game, what would I what would I say? You know, what would interest me in a project like this? Because what a lot of people don't understand who don't play these types of games is you're looking at an investment, not just from you, but from five or six other people of hundreds of hours of their time. And so before you're willing to make that kind of investment, you need some sort of, I don't know, assurance that it's worth that time. And so when I crafted the video, I was trying to give those assurances about why it might be worth their time to invest. 
That's right. It's, it takes a lot of work to go battle space aliens. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, you know, and with these games, and for those of you who aren't familiar with role-playing games, basically it's an interactive story where uh, you tell a story together as a group of people, um, and occasionally you'll roll dice to help, you know, move the story along or figure out how things move. And in some ways, it's it's similar to, like, the dad coming up with a story for his children at night, and the children have a voice in how the story goes, <laughs> and, but with dice. I mean, I guess if I was to summarize role-playing game on a really kind of basic level. and But one of the things that makes it a lot of work is that you have to create your character at the beginning before you get started. And there's all these questions to answer about your character. You have to create their whole backstory. And, you know, for authors, it's really fun, you know, but it also can take a long time because they write an epic backstory about the character and put in all their stats, et cetera. Yeah, it can definitely be a a lot of overhead. Uh, And it's really daunting to convince a group of people to try to pick one of these up. You need someone who's willing to read effectively a college textbook, understand how all the systems work, and then teach a group of people to play that game. And that's a big ask. All right. Well, uh, we're just about out of time. Do you have any final tips or encouragement? Um, keep writing. <laughs> keep writing. Keep building that email list, I will say. Because if, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this, it's how easy this has been for Chris. I mean, he did a lot of things right with his campaign, but he also he didn't work that hard. I mean, he had a baby, but it did. it was okay because he'd already done the work over six years building the email list and building up trust and relationship with his readers and working in this game and referencing it in the book so that a lot of people were aware that the game was coming. And that groundwork, building the crowd, if you can get a good enough crowd, the funding is easy. And that's what we're seeing. You know, Chris so far has raised $15,000. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't hit closer to 30000 uh, when this is all said and done. Uh, we'll have a link to chrisfoxwrites.com. We'll also have a link to Magitech chronicles.com and a link straight to this kickstarter page which uh chris i was not able to find a link to it on your website so you might want to add it to your sidebar for the next 21 days um we'll also have a link to the ads for authors course and a link to kick track if any of you want to play with that and take a look at the charts and get a sense uh, of, of how that works Our sponsor today is the Ultimate Crowdfunding Course. This is the course that I put together on crowdfunding. And fun fact, it was the first ever crowdfunding course to successfully be crowdfunded on a crowdfunding platform. So it's a little (laughs) meta. Others had tried before and failed. This was the first one to succeed. And it's specifically for authors. How to crowdfund your book. I've helped uh, novelists crowdfund. I've helped children's book authors crowdfund. And I've helped nonfiction books crowdfund, uh, raising tens of thousands of dollars to make indie books as professional and successful as possible. And we break it down step by step, what to do ahead of time, what to do during, and what to do after. Uh, It's based off a lot of lessons I learned the hard way to uh, having both successful and failed crowdfunding uh, campaigns. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And our featured patron is Michael Jack Webb, author of Infernal Gates. Time is running out for Ethan Freeman, an ex-Special Forces Ranger, to stop a conspiracy to free the Destroyer and his horde of fallen angels. So thank you, Michael Jack Webb, uh, for being a patron of the podcast, helping us stay on the air. Patreon, uh, which we use, is a crowdfunding platform. It's a little bit different than Kickstarter, but uh, many of you are, are using that to keep us on the air, and I really do appreciate it. If you can't afford to become a patron, you can always help the show by just sharing a link to this episode in a Facebook group of authors who you think would find it helpful. You've been listening to Thomas Umstead Jr. and Chris Fox back from his hiatus on the Novel Marketing Podcast. Uh, If you want to find show notes for this episode or to get new episodes delivered to your phone automatically, visit novelmarketing.com. Thanks for listening.